Thanks very much, Eve. So, Tasula uh, Gumgo Manning Ship Salt, Asan Lake, Dunough, Tony Kirby is Hanum Dum. I hope you enjoyed the lecture tonight. Tony Kirby is my name. Um, I've got interest in the subject of folklore and mythology extremely recently. And the reason was um, a film company in Scotland got in touch with me a few months ago and asked me to do an interview for a, an upcoming series of 10 programmes, a series of 10 called Spooked Ireland, the film next year on Discovery Channel. They'd already one, done one on uh, ten series of ten and spooked Scotland and it was very successful. And they they're moving on to Ireland now and I had to do an interview with them and uh, so did a crash course in folklore and mythology and that was a few months ago and it's been extremely addictive ever since. You know, mm. um, my work is trying to read the landscape for a living and professional tour guide and this is an area that I haven't really touched on in the last twenty years and now I just can't get away from it. Uh, in terms of the talk tonight. Um, it's called uh, Supernatural Burns, largely in North Clare. Uh, it's folklore and mythology. And just to make a distinction between the two, do you want to turn off the light, Eve? Sure. Please. So um, they're both belief systems, but there is a difference. Uh, mythology is macro. It's usually kind of fictional events, characters uh, that correspond to big uh, religious or phenomenal events. Folklore or folk belief, in particular in folklore, is local, it's micro, and it's uh, events that are kind of small and particularly local to a community. And just to give you an example of one and the other, that is a photograph from a holy well in Fenor, in, um, here in the Berlin. And, um, sorry, I have to say, my main source for all I talk about tonight is the school's collection 3738. It's about quarter of a million manuscript pages of young kids interviewing their elders. It was commissioned by uh, Emma Eamon de Valera at the time. It's one of the most important folklore collections in Europe, if not beyond half a million manuscript pages. And most of the stuff I'm doing tonight is from mine, from that source. Some of it was in Irish that I translated and more was in English. And this particular story was in the Irish language. St. Colum Kill is the saint. Uh, the well is uh, reputed to have uh, cure for eyes. And St. Colum Kill was in Aran, like a lot of saints in Inishmore, and he was attending the school of asceticism of Aina or Enda. He had a row with him, came back to the mainland, and he came along on horse, and he arrived at this point where there is a uh, water body, and this is the mark of the horse hoof on the stone. And I'd read about this in Irish, translated to English, and I went to the site and thought, God, you know, never find that, and it's lying just beside the well. That is folklore, that's folk belief. People genuinely believe in the past that that was the imprint of the horse hoof of Cullum Kill. Uh, on the other hand, this is mythology here. I'm sorry the, uh, the detail is not good, but it's Termin in Carron, up in Carron. It's on the, the hill there and written on it on the um, archae old archaeology maps from the 1800s is uh, an, a monument. It's, uh, it's uh, it's a prehistoric tomb and written on his Dear Mid and Grania's bed. So it's not marked as a monument scientifically. It's believed to be the bed of Dear Mid and Grania. You all probably know the story. It's mythological, but Dear Mid and Grania are from... Um, Dear Mid is from Nafina, uh, which is a pseudo-historical kind of warrior hunter group. Um, and Grania is fixed up with Fionn, Fionn McCool, the leader of that group. And Grania has other intentions. And she actually uh, courts Dermot and they run off because obviously Fionn and his uh, warriors are going to try to bust up this kind of uh, elopement. And what Dermot and Grania do is they elope to uh, around Ireland, different place every night to either a cave or a megalithic tomb. And um, our foremost, arguably foremost living archaeologist, Dr. Harbson said, you know, these tombs in which they stayed every night were arguably Ireland's first bed and breakfasts. Uh, and uh, eventually they were caught. I think the deal was, he was told, don't under any circumstances go into a cave and overnight there in which there's only one entrance. He broke that gash. He went into a cave where there was only one entrance and there was no other possible mode of escape. And uh, that elopement was broken up. And 
this me talking about the past, but in Car Blonick, in Killaboy, the townland I live in, which is a few minutes here from Car, a man who passed away a few years ago, about 10 years ago, I was in looking at one of these uh, wedge tombs uh, in a field and I was coming out and he said, we're in looking at the lava. He didn't know it as a tomb, a lava. So these things enjoy dual reputations. One is archaeology science and the other is folk belief, even to a little extent today perhaps, people believing that this is uh, points of elopement, uh, overnight stations for these uh, mythological people. That's macro, that's huge, because that corresponds in time to the um, the uh, Bronze Age in Ireland. So it's it's a huge, huge thing. It's a huge uh, period our civilization is covering. And um, that's uh, the difference between mythology and folklore. They can overlap a bit, but largely that's the difference between the two. The next slide, please, Eve. So what I'm going to do now is do a bit of mythology. Um, I have my content here. I'll just tell you what the talk will consist of, if I may. Yeah, we're going to do a little bit of mythology. It's supposed to be only folklore tonight. The next part of mythology is folklore pertaining to archaeology. Back to that. I'm going to do a couple of fairies because they're the big squeeze of the evening. And I'm going to do the Banshee and the Pook. I've picked out them and I hope uh, for good reason. I'm going to deal then with natural features in the landscape which are believed to be portals to the other world like trees as in fairy trees, caves and lakes as well. And then penultimately I'm going to talk a little about one of the most notorious figures in folklore in all of Clare. That is, of course, the local woman, Maura Rua. And finally, finally, I'm going to have an epilogue where I talk about a remarkable folklorist, truly remarkable folklorist, one of our greatest ever folklorists, who lived two townlands east of here in her last 20 years of her life, 1967 to 1987. That is, of course, Maura McNeil. That's the structure of the evening. And I'm down on Clifton Hill, near, not far from where Morris House was now. And I was here yesterday for the first time, so um, it was all new to me. And this is the story, we're still on it, the Finn cycle, it's Fionn McCool. And Fionn McCool has, um, uh, uh, he's the leader of this warrior uh, 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 hunter, tr uh, hunter group. And he's got a hound, and the hound is called Bran. And Bran is monstrous and he's very loyal to him. And it started this hunt at, the belief is, at Schlieve Callan, kind of further back west. And they get eventually near this lake and the deer that they're chasing is out, out, outrun everybody except Fionn McCool and Bran. And there's cliffs here to the right, they don't see, show very well here. And they're coming to the cliffs and the deer jumps and he plunges in. And Bran, the dog, plunges in after. And the two drown. And poor old Fionn is left perplexed and disconsolate on the shore right there. This was a belief in this immediate area in the past and in areas besides all over Ireland. Loads of these stories related to Fionn and Bran. Um, so um, this, this particular lake is called Loch Tier Vic Bran. The, uh, this is the official title of it, the Lake of the Land of the Son of Bran. But it's also known as Molly Blood's Lake. And the reason, sorry, I just want to say there, those words in, in inverted commas, there are Michael McMahon, the eminent local historian, who said there's many legends attached to this lake. I've only told one. You see how rich a kind of mythological landscape we're in, in microgeography here. And to add to the paranormality of this landscape here, this little landscape, this lake, uh, a woman in the mid 20th century, I believe, called Molly Blood, is reputed to have drowned there. And she lived in the Delphi house. So when I was there yesterday, I was at a Delphi house and I saw a path over here. And of course, there's a path down to the lake from which people at Delphi house must have in the past enjoyed to swim. She drowned and a Delphi house is believed to be haunted by the ghost of Molly Blood. So just an extraordinary kind of paranormal, supernatural landscape in a small area quite near here on a number of levels. Beliefs about the, the you know, F uh, Bran and, and, and Fionn mythological heroes, genuinely the belief in them and the belief in the recent past that the spirit of Molly Blood is around there as well. Thanks for that. So let's broaden this out a bit because we're talking about Clifton Hill here in general. This is a photograph from Clifton Hill looking out over to uh, Mullock Moor and the Berlin National Park. And Clifton Hill is one of 28 sites in Ireland, it's called Farmeal, and Farmeal means bald, means bare, means kind of a bare place, wilderness-like. And also they're curious in character, these landforms. They've got a steep front slope, uh, these particular landscapes in these hills. They're always about 90 to 250 metres in height. 
Clifton Hill is about 193, it's highest. And then they've got a back slope, which is access, because they had to have access. And we're talking about, again, Nafina, the warriors, the hunters. And uh, these four meals, wherever you have these land landforms, only 28 of them, these are believed to be mythological landscapes of Fionn Makul and his warrior hunter, hunter place. And this is an exceedingly rich Clifton Hill mythological landscape of Fionn Makul and Bran. So I gave you one geographical place named there, uh, Loch Tirvik Bran. But you also have on this hill, you've got uh, Cahar Oisin. Got my son in the background there, Oisin, like, you know. But Oisin is the son of Fionn, and this, fair, this ring, or ring fort on the hill is believed to be, uh, it does legend attached to Oisin. And then you've got Sea Finn, which is Fionn, the seat of Fionn, and there's a cairn, prehistoric tomb, and uh, the story to it is ascribed uh, to, 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 to Fionn. So an exceedingly rich mythological landscape. But on top of that, on top of that, anywhere you have any of these 28 four meals in Ireland, in the Middle Ages, this is human history, fact now, they were used by royal elites for hunting. They liked to hunt in the mythological landscapes of um, of Fionn McCool, and one of the royal palaces of the Kings of Cashel stood in Clifton Hill. Uh, and it's Seamus Heaney, it's Heaney that said this, this kind of overlap and interlinking between archaeology, mythology, geography and history constitutes sense of place in its richest possible manifestation. That's that. Uh, I'm just going to another four meal site now, and it's the second one in North Clare. There's four of these four meal sites out of 28 in Ireland, County Clare, these with the curious landforms we described, which were mythologically uh, hunting grounds for Fionnish people, and historically where there was uh, the, roy the, roy the royalty in a thousand years gone used to hunt in. This one's about 275 metres above sea level. It's um, on the peak of Blackhead, just the northwestern corner of Blackhead. And right here near this arched uh, number here, there was Sea Finn. So that's um, it's a prehistoric tomb or cairn, which is described mytho mythologically to have a story related to Fionn. It's a f but here beside it, nearly level, according to West Hopi Antiquarian, this 100 years ago, so nearly gone. Um, and here we have what I consider to be uh, the most astonishing monument in all of the Burren. For me, it's highly subjective, obviously, this. But this here is a fragile looking arch cairn which I've been told was built in the last hundred years, even less time, by enthusiasts locally who wanted, in the, the context of the sea fin of Fionn, that archaeological monument declining going, they wanted to put something in this place to perpetuate the tradition of Fionn Makul. And it's, uh, I told Liz Fitzpatrick, the, Dr. Liz Fitzpatrick of NUI Galway about this. She hadn't known of it. She is the foremost living world authority on these uh, 28 mythological landscapes of Fionn in Ireland. And she was staggered by it, that there was this tenacity of tradition less than 100 years ago that people went to these lengths uh, to uh, perpetuate the, um, the, 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 the icon and the memory of Fionn McCool. So it's a remarkable structure, that one is. So that's the two uh, Fionn McCool mythological landscapes in North Clare, very briefly. But I'm now going to go on. I hope I'm not speaking too quickly. I'll slow down a bit. I get excited, you know. <laughs> anyway, on a serious note, that was a little bit of mythology. And now I'm going into folklore, the other belief system, the micro, the local. But we're still in the area of archaeology and we're still in the business of cairns. But this one now is not being believed to be, uh, you know, a site of Fionn McCool and his band of warriors uh, uh, from, from, from prehistory. This is something I got from the National Folklore School scheme over the last few days and reading this. I'm so excited to read about it. So there's two hills there in the northwest of Burning. Margaret Fitzgerald, she's a great hill walker. She knows them all, you know. But they're amazing walking country. The Schlieve Carron around Eagles Rock. And this is on the peak of that. And across from it, you have Turlock Hill. And they're about, you know, a couple of hundred metres above sea level, both of them. And according to the folk belief, this is 1930s, folklore schools came to schools collection. <laughs> These two cairns, this one here and the one across from it at Turlock Hill, are in memory of two old women. And one of them, on one top of one hill, was smoking. And the other who lived at, near the top of the other hill shouted over and said, give us a smoke. And the first one, the client, said, I'm not giving you one. And the one that didn't get the smoke started pelting stones across at the one on top of the other hill. And they pelted and they pelted and pelted. And thus, the two heaps were formed. 
and that's called Cairn Bower because every tomb in Cairn and I'm reading every fort in, in North Cairn and besides I'm learning now from the schools collection has a distinct name and that means the deaf Cairn for whatever reason. 327 metres above sea level and now for the science which is much more boring. It's about 30 metres square and it's about 5 metres high. And Westrop, the great antiquarian who was prone to understatement says it's of a considerable size. But in the 1930s, in the folklore schools came, a young lad interviewed an elder who told him they're still there in memory of them. And this is remarkable, less than 100 years ago, there was people in this area who believed that these um, particular huge stone constructions were related to the story of these two women who uh, threw stones across each other. And finally, look at the ideological lines between uh, local belief and, um, and science two heaps of stones. This is just the exact words of the man, the young fellow getting the story from his elder in the school's collection. They call them heaps of stones in the parish. They're called cairns, they say. They call them cairns, which are scientifically prehistoric tombs, and we just regard them heaps of stones thrown by the women at each other. Okay, so that's one archaeology. It's called, by the way, mythic archaeology. Mythic archaeology. The science is archaeology, but in, in people imposing kind of mythological, fiction or folklore understandings upon them. So this is. Uh, I'm sorry, the photograph isn't great, but these here are uh, gravestones. They're uninscribed. They're very humble, and there's more within there. But the scrub, unfortunately, has taken over. Now, any of local here? This is New Key, and if you know the. The Russell Gallery is a lovely cafe in it. Stefania and okay, what's my name? anyway, they took they're lovely people. It was the, the husband Andrew, Andy. Andy took me to show me this. I had I how did I find out of it? I found out from Andy actually. He told me about this. It does not record a documented anything, and it's an unbaptized baby's burial ground. And he brought me to show me this anyway, just a, a few fields from their cafe. And lo and behold, went into the school's collection and I was thrilled because there's not much on Killini or unbaptized children's burial grounds. And there's a great story in it. And long ago, three new key men milking the cows. They were crossing the unbaptized baby's burial ground. And the man, one of the three men said, God be with the girl who got buried here in the last few days. If she alive, she'd be milking the cows. The Lord have mercy on her soul. And a voice came up very plain and said, the Lord have mercy on the dead. And it, this is remarkable for a couple of reasons, of course, because unbaptized babies burial grounds in the past by the church and, you know, endorsed by the people as well, they accepted the doctrine of church, were regarded to be, these weren't really babies at all. These were categories of otherness. They didn't deserve to be buried in, in God's grave ground and the afterlife, they didn't necessarily get to heaven, they went to limbo. They were a category of otherness. And um, so it's interesting that they believed these gentlemen that there was a spirit speaking to them. These babies are not babies, they're restless spirits, they're fairies. And this is endorsing the church view, really, of things. And then what she says is fascinating. He says, the Lord have mercy on her soul. And she says back, the Lord have mercy on the dead. As if it's suggesting without exception, just the dead. Lord have mercy on us all. Not just those who ended up in consecrated ground, but us, everybody equal. Uh, so that's a little about doubt. And again, unbaptized baby girls, the dual reputation of these archaeological ones, scientifically, archaeologically, historically, places consigned for the unbaptized ones. But graveyards also, are, these are graveyards, a place of dark, malevolent activity. You know, and you dare not trifle with them. The belief that they're not really babies or could be babies, but they're restless souls and spirits and fairies as well. And uh, so that's that. So... Uh, what I'm going to do now is talk about a couple of fairies in particular and uh, the Banshees are sexy these days. I was watching the, the Golden Globe last night and Colin Farrell and said, all these people all over the world, millions of people using this word now and loads of them go to a dictionary to find out what it means, you know. It's great. Of course, Banshee, it's Gaelic. It's the, the fairy woman, you know, literally. And there's, there's a few theories about the, her like the, the the banshee like where she comes from but the most dominant theory is that she's a keener and keeners were professional in Ireland to keen and wail on, on the death of people um, and and uh, it, 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 this this keening at funerals uh, survived in Ireland uh, into the early 20th century it's quite remarkable but um, 
So the, the, she was a keener, she died, and then she's, you know, it, it comes back as an unbaptized, a fallen angel sent to this world to get penance and forgiveness. Sorry, they're two different things. I mixed up the two. Deceased keener, but another theory is an unbaptized fallen angel. And again, the idea of this intermingling of the unbaptized babies and, and the fairies. She's a death messenger and her, her appearance is varied. Um, but the, 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 the sounds associated with impending death, the sounds associated were these light sounds, tappings and knocks. <laughs> And from folklore school scheme, I've picked out things like there was a light in her hand and she knocks on the door with a loud rattle. These are, these are the noise of impending death that she makes, you know. But the most distinguishing characteristic of her is the cry. It's loud and uh, low as well, you know. So this is um, uh, back in New Quay. And this is the house of the Skerrits. Skerrits were anglo Norms when the tribes of Galway. They moved down to Galway from Clare and they built this. Uh, mansion here just uh, by the sea in New Quay. Um, uh, but we'll get to that in a second. And here's some of the protocol relating to Banshees. No right to speak to Banshee unless she speaks first. And if she touched you, well, that's really misfortunes about to attend you. Now, the belief was that Banshees only followed old Irish families, aristocracy, you know, anyone with an O and a Mac in their name. But that's not entirely true. There's an example of the lines in County Limerick who weren't of pure Irish blood. You know, they're probably uh, English to an extent, they had a mix of blood in them. And they had their own banshee. And the Skerrits, who are definitely not pure Irish, if you want to use that term, they're Anglo-Norman of origin, they had an in-house banshee in this house. And uh, no one would disturb it. It had a room of its own. No one would disturb it. And uh, to heighten the, 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 the mythological or paranormal landscape of the immediate vicinity of the Skerritt House, Finnevara House is called, the domain is said to be, again, school's collection, full of different colour horses ridden by small creatures. So it's a really kind of spooky place. And here we go here from the school's collection again, from the Corrifin School. I got this, the last time the Banshee was heard in Corrifin, according to an elder to a young fella in the school's collection, a woman called Brazil was being waked and people heard it in the direction of Loch Awn. I'm just wondering, Sir Francis, do you know where Loch Awn is? Up Fair Lock Lane. Yeah, up Fair you Lane. Continue up Fair Lane and you know when you go up to the country, there's yes. go there, there's a little bit kind of a bit blind down to the right, it's the Loch Awn. Thanks a lot, uh, Anora. So that's remarkably recent, it's in this little parish and um, that's, that's a little bit about the Banshee, you know. This is the big deal. This is the, big, the, the this is this is a great story about the puka. But we we'll talk a little about the puka and Ennis Diamond in North Clare because it's it's a fascinating story and a fascinating twist in the story of this multifunctional Irish supernatural entity. I'd love if they were my words, but they're not mine. They're of the folklorist Jasun Brannock, a shapeshifter. He could become a dog, a cow, a horse, and other animals beside him. It makes him supernatural. He becomes this animal, but he's the power of human speech. So really supernatural creature, active at night, and particularly lone travellers at night, night like tonight now, you know. We came, here, we came out of warm, bright houses. We drove in our cars. Uh, we come into a nice brown, loads of people. But uh, in the past, it wasn't like there'd be lone travellers crossing all those rough hills, and I'd be afraid of, lives. I'd be afraid of my life out there tonight. I would be in those hills. but. few weeks in County Clare became a, a, a virulently contested 21st century icon and I don't think that's a bad thing you know. Um, so the County Council essentially what they wanted was for Ennis Diamond they wanted to make it more a destination town not a corridor effect where everyone just goes through on the way to Lahinch to get people to slow down a bit and visit the beautiful town that Ennis Diamond is and the idea was an eye-catching sculpture this is the root of it all um, people would stop take the photograph and maybe just you know, spend a little time in the town and, and that. And uh, they had a, a, a competition and uh, Aidan Hart, uh, he, he won it and his proposal was the puka. It's two metres high, it's a bronze statue, it's on a plinth and interestingly enough it's half man, half horse. And why is that interesting? Because the puka, if he's, if he's a shapeshifter, he either became 
an animal like a cow, cow, cow a horse or a, a goat or whatever or otherwise he'd be human with some animal features like furry stuff or and so he wouldn't have been half man half horse but this is art we're in this is the realm of art so you know it, this is fine and I think and this is purely personal opinion I think it's a magnificent work of art, but that's only my personal opinion. But it, it proved highly divisive in Ennestymon, as we know, and it gained nas local, national and international attention to the story. Now, the three things in, in Ennestymon, why people were against, people in Ennestymon, some were for it and some against, some thought it was distasteful. You know, they didn't like it, you know. And that's entirely fair, of course. That's an opinion. Some people just don't like it at all and said, like, we don't think it'd be appropriate here. Some thought it was irrelevant. Not many. They said the puka would not have hung out in places like this. There's no lore or history pertaining to the puka. And this time, this is kind of a contrived tradition. And the third thing, and it was a bit more marginal, was the parish priest described it as sinister from the pulpit. Uh, so, Which was interesting in a way because this is almost a replay of the latter part of the 1800s when there was this standoff between an emboldened Roman Catholic Church and the peasant people in Ireland and it, where there was a, you know, an effort quite successfully the Roman Catholic Church to shepherd people away from the cosmological like this into official Catholicism. So the sec what happened as a result of that Clare County Council, they went for an online survey. Now, I don't think this kind of stuff is a good idea because there's no rigour attached to it. There's no way of controlling who's voting how many times or anything like that. And in the end, does it matter? Like, you know, if I not voting an online survey on a piece of art in the street. But 55% um, were against, 45% were for. But as Dean referred to said in the Irish Times, the puka was cancelled. Like, you choose, like, what's left? If the puka's cancelled, you know, and the puka was cancelled, and then we had a vacuum. And the county council obviously has this 30,000 euro piece of stuff. and they're saying like, you know, it can't end up in a warehouse. So they asked for expressions of interest in our Clare. Ballyvaughan Community Development Group came in with an expression. They would have liked it on the main street in Ballyvaughan. And the Michael Cusick Centre in Carron came in as well. The Michael Cusick Centre actually uh, got the, uh, the, the statue in the end. And Aidan Hart said it took a long time to go a short way. You know, from Ennis Diamond to Karen, you know. I've been up to see it and uh, I think the location it's in, Michael Music Centre, is extremely sensitive and extremely important. It's away from the buildings. It's in a place which is kind of a sense of isolation. That's very important it is there. And um, the whole thing, by the way, provoked debate, we said. Huge media attention. Nationally, internationally, I read a piece for research this from The Guardian, the quality newspaper in England. A mural on Stefan Ungler's bakery, commissioned by him, by a local artist, Gorman, and that provoked a kind of a, a standoff between Aidan Hart and the mural people. The kind of letters were exchanged, and uh, Stefan, I consider him a friend of mine, and dealt with it very, very well. The mural stays, and Hart was nice to say you can have the mural stay. Two songs, one by oh, Caleary, he's called, I forget his first name, and the second fellow is Enda Heron, a local. Enda Heron's song was for, Caleary's song was against. And I've been told there's a Netflix next year to be a Netflix documentary on it. It's 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 Sorry, just <laughs> it is truly truly remarkable. But what I think about the whole thing was, it was all worth it in the end. You know, uh, conflict can be good, and you know, difference of opinion can be good, and sometimes good solutions come from it. And um, I've read and been told by the scientists that Pook is like lonely, weird isolated places and I don't think Ennis Diamond is lonely weird or isolated you know it's a beautiful sorry if you go back a sec it's it's a it's a beautiful um, town I've, I've uh, an awful lot of time for it I love the place my eldest son goes to school there and I love any occasion to visit but it really isn't a place where the puka would have hung out and where did he end up he ended up in the townland called Paolo Fuca the puka came home Paolo Fuca means uh, the, uh, the, the dell, the, uh, he ended up in a wild, lonely dell where there was, in that immediate area, belief in the past would, that the puka did exist and legend attached to him. So he did end up at home in the end. So it's an overall a Hollywood ending, you know. That's the puka. So I'd like to talk a little about fairy trees now. Uh, that's a couple of fairies. But I'd like to talk to natural features in the landscape where, which are believed to be housed the fairies. And uh, the tree most closely associated with the fairy in Ireland is the white thorn or hawthorn, and nobody seems to know why. But 
sorry? If Bloom is on the other That's half. correct, yeah. And uh, yeah. Now, Marion McCarty is, might be Dr. Marion McCarty. She's a brilliant folklorist. She writes uh, online for RTE, amazing series of articles on, on folklore. And her theory is the following, that in, it blooms in May and the blossom has a chemical in it called triethylamine and it's also present in uh, the, 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 the blossom, this isn't a blossom, this is used to attract insects and this is also present in, in, in the stage of a tissue decay in our bodies. So she says it's associated the smell with death. Remember this is a past in which wakes were, were prevalent in Ireland. People would stand all night with a coffin with person in it. There was no embalming and you'd be familiar with the smell of death, you know, with this smell of tissue decay. So it may be associated with, by death with these people. And also it's got a musky fragrance, which he says is, uh, is, would remind one of sexual bodily fluids. And she says these connections with sex and death may have given it a strangeness or otherworldliness. And it's a really interesting theory. There's legions of stories regarding people being, har uh, being harmed who actually interfered with these trees, damaged or cut them. And um, there's, there's so many of them. Uh, but like, and he's, look at these dates, how recent they are. But 1975, the famous DeLorean car in um, the futuristic car, Dunmurray in North Belfast, very briefly. There was a fairy tree believed by locals on the Greenfield site. Everything was cleared, bulldozed by local Belfast workforce. And then they were left with one tree, a Hawthorne, Whitehorn tree. And he said to Mr. Dixon, who was DeLorean's representative on earth, tall man, 6'6", six, six, with a cowboy hat from Tech, said, we're not cutting that tree. And Dixon says, what? And he says, oh, no, there's fairies in it. And he says, no, you're joking me, you know. And they said, we are not cutting that tree. And we think if we cut that tree, the story of this thing won't end well. And what Dixon did was he got members of the workforce of America to go out in the dead of night. They cut down the tree and of course, 19, I forget what date, but about 10 years later, DeLorean just went bust, you know. And some people this day said, like, we told them, you know, just leave the tree there. Um, 1999, this is a story of a tree that survived. And this, of course, the great folklorist Eddie Linnan. It's the N18, Limerick Clare, it's at Latoon, just by Newmarket and Fergus. <laughs> And Linen was told by a local man that this, is, this fairy tree was a battle site of the Connacht and Munster fairies. And he wrote a letter to the Irish Times. That was it. One letter, Irish Times newspaper. And as Lennon said, it went viral in an age that, where things couldn't go viral like we do today. And it went to England, it went to the United States. And it was a popular campaign to say, leave the tree alone. And Clare County Council decided to change the route of the... M18 and the tree is still standing there. It's a remarkable tenacity tradition. Remember, the Republic of Ireland is the second most globalised nation on earth, according to the United Nations globalisation. This is a remarkable tenacity of tradition, uh, of, of, of tradition in our lifetimes. It's linked, as uh, Eve says, with Maytime, Bialtana. And, you know, it must have been wonderful sights going by, by people's homes around Bialtana, this great pre Christian festival in, in the month of May, uh, to see. Uh, Hawthorn trees decorated with flowers and ribbons and eggshells and candles and rush lights. But that was outside and that was to ward off evil from you and your animals and that. But um, inside the house it was considered if the Hawthorn came in, well, it is bad news. You Under no circumstance would bring it into the house. <coughs> A.T. Lucas, the great scholar, he did a survey, a random survey, 210 holy wells. 103 or 210 had hawthorn trees at them, which were believed like the well work to be supernatural, have the power to shepherd away your illness if you tied a part of your clothing to them. Uh, in, so here we are, sorry, to get to this tree in particular. This is a doline, it's a tiny depression. Now, any of you are familiar with Cahar Command, the magnificent uh, triple fort there in the townland of Cahar Command, just up the road here. When you're walking into that, um, there's a wall on your right side when you get near it, it gets in, in your eye line the fort and that's a townland wall between Carcommon and Tully Common. This is just over the wall, you can see it in Tully Common and it's a white thorn or hawthorn tree and it's in a little doline or depression. Now, a man called Blair, Blair, I forget, do you remember his first name? Gibson Blair? Uh, from Blair Gibson, the Blair Gibson. I got his name wrong there. Blair Gibson, the archaeologist from California. <laughs> he wanted to excavate within the Doline because there was evidence of a prehistoric structure within. And he went to the landowner, I know her name and all that, but no need to say it, it doesn't matter anyway. And the landowner said that you'll be allowed to excavate there if you give me a solemn prophet, promise that that tree will not be interfered with. And Blair, uh, Blair Gibson gave it a solid 
a solemn promise and a fantastic excavation results came out of it, you know. Um, and of course, I, I'm not going to talk about forts tonight as well, the same principle of forts as well as trees being inhabited by fairies, fairy places. But in both cases, the idea is you placate, you appease them, you don't interfere with them, you respect these things. And you might leave milk there or something stronger like whiskey or food just to appease the fairies. And someone said, this is playing it safe because they believe in Catholicism. Now, the late 1800s in Ireland, or pre-famine, it was kind of a casual adherence to Catholicism, but they did believe in some things in Catholicism, like baptism and, and marriage and, and, and funerals and all that. But, you know, mass going was very low and all that. They had a dual kind of religious thing going on, and this was part of it. So it's remarkable their, their religion less than 200 years ago, casual adherence to Roman Catholicism and a tenacious hold on pre-Christian spiritual beliefs. And this business of leaving stuff at trees or forts for the fairs is, is called playing it safe, keeping in with everybody, you know. So, okay. Have you any good news for me now? Okay. So we talk about caves a little now, you know. And if anyone's getting browned off with this, just tell me. I think it'll be another 15 minutes maybe. So uh, let me know. These are the caves of wild horses. Again, highly local. It's Kilcorny. It's a huge depression uh, in the landscape. And caves in Ireland are, you know, portals to the other world. You can imagine how these would be, imagine places where spirits are mysterious places. They're dark inside, you know, we're out in the light. Uh, they're confined spaces, they've got an end to them and all this. How these would be world, other world places. There's a photograph I got from the interle internet of a couple of Yorkshire cavers outside the entrance to the Kilcorny Cave. Uh, according to the great cave archaeologist Marion Dowd, 980 of them have been documented in Ireland, 980 caves, and that's in 2015. And 91 of the 980 are registered as archaeological sites, so the mostly prehistoric peoples kind of use them as sites for ritual and other besides. They, but also in terms of folklore and more recently, the most of these sites are, haven't archaeology in them, there's belief that these are world, other world places. Uh, and you, you can see here, in terms of the archaeology, if we stay with that for a minute, in prehistory there were prim primarily theatres of ritual, world, other world places. Christianity they were inhabited for long periods, and in recent centuries wider range of activities. But most of them, if not all of them, might not, some of them are only some of them are archaeologically used. Even the ones that are not, there's this belief that they're world other places. Huge depression in Kilcorny, and outside it, outside the cave, there's a beautiful grassy place. Like you know, it's real world other world. You know, uh, great grazing country up there. The cliffs are thirty meters high here, and then you're out in the grassy place, and the passage is about eight hundred and sixty-five meters in. Never been in there, prone to floods. And apparently the hydrology is the water pours out from the caves and there's a deafening noise. The water hits the, the roof of the cave, it becomes trapped in the roof and it creates loud booming noises and it comes gushing out and then floods the field. So you can imagine the sense of paranormality being heightened all the time regarding this is a strange place. The entrance gets submerged, the wildly, wildly fluctuating extreme environment and it enriches the imagination and the imagination brings out the, the folklore. So, um, so yeah, there's belief to be inhabited by wild, wild horses. They're, they're spiritual, you know, they're, 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 they're mythological or spiritual or folk belief that there's wild horses there. Um, and to come out once a day at a very specified time for one hour to graze on the beautiful grass. And things like dead fish and enchanted birds have been thrown out of the cave and it gets submerged with water. And they were described as being marvellous horses. And two boys captured a foal. Once Upon a Time, Folklore Collection, and when I brought it away and a couple of years later he was using it as, um, for ploughing and the plough broke and the boy starts to curse and lift his hand at the horse and the horse takes him away to the cave and the boy was never seen again. And the, boy, the boys meet a little old man and the, the, the water that is between the cave and the green grass, he says don't cross it. And the dog, the boys obeyed him, but their dog didn't, and he was never seen again. And Maura Ru, who we'll get to in a little while, the title lady from uh, the 17th century, she trained one. I will tell you in a little while what she did with the trained horse. And finally, this is finally, this is my one piece of oral history tonight that I wrote on. I didn't record it 
from an elder who's since unfortunately passed away, he told me that a German musical band played music through the cave and they ended up at Neuvel, three kilometres away, where they emerged at the beautiful early Christian monastic site with oratory. The inconvenient, boring scientific truth is that's three kilometres and the passage is only less than one kilometre. But this was a folk belief of this man. And I've heard, I told that to somebody recently and they said, he named another man and said, I've heard it from another man who's living. This is the folk belief pertaining to that cave. This, sorry, this photograph is not very good, but this is on the R480. So it's kind of on the main road before you turn left to Kilcarney, before Paul Lebrone. And it seems to be, nobody seems to know anything about this rock art. I presume it's quite recent, last hundred years. But I presume it's on the main drag before you turn off, just kind of uh, celebrating the, uh, the wild horses of Kilcorn. Quite beautiful. It's on the roadside. You can see it there. So now, just Lake <coughs> Monsters. Um, so you, you're all gone about Nessie and uh, in, in, in Loch Ness in the Highlands in Scotland, the world's most famous lake monster. Um, but Michael McMahon, our eminent local historian, says there's scarcely a lake of any size in County Clare without a story of some strange animal beneath its water. So we have them all around us here, these lake monsters and the belief in them. And this is Ra, just south of here. And uh, it's the Brock She, it's the belief in the fairy badger, the Brock She. And this was first to told in the life of St. Macreha. Uh, uh, St. Macree, do you call it Macree in English? Macree, yeah. yeah. Um, and he, he's a saint associated most uh, notably with the uh, monastic site of Liscanor. Um, uh, it first appeared, appeared actually, witness, written account of someone seeing it in the 6th century. And what he would do is almost daily deprecations around Loch Ra of cattle and people. These were his targets. And of course, he's attacking the cattle, he's getting at the people, his cattle are the livelihood of the people. So what do fairies do when you cross, you don't treat them well? Well, they get at you, you know, they attack you, the people, the cattle are important to you, and they tamper with your look, your health, or your home. Or your fortune. That's pe people never call them fairies, you know, just uh, the good people. Just keep on saying, call, call them positive terms. And that's why people never interfered with a lot of these places like archaeological ones where they were believed to it because, like, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't interact with them. Uh, so the story goes, there was supplication made to, sorry, I'm keeping you out of it here, you know. No, right, sorry. back to the two of ye. <laughs> supplication made to look St. Blamock. Bla, Bla I'm not sure I should know that. And he, he didn't come up trumps. Like he wasn't up to the task, you know, to get rid of this fella. So he went out, uh, the, 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 the tender went out wider. And McCrea, who's noted, um, as Francis would tell you here in West Clare, for dealing with these kind of monster sea monsters as well, was, 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 was brought in. And he did the job. He kind of uh, chained at the bottom of the lake. These lakes are considered to be kind of enchanted lakes. And fairies are at the bottom of things and he, he gets a reprieve one day every seven years and this is of course terribly important in mythology in Ireland seven the number seven and of course you know we have a brilliant island off Ireland High Brazil mythological island and that's believed to only appear once in seven years so highly significant as well last sighting January 1931 very recently by local men I made the front page of the Clare Champion and it's he was seen for several hours the sporting on the lake surface having a crack it's great. It's great stuff. That's one lake monster. I'd like to do one other. That, that was taken on a bad day. This was taken on a beautiful day, you know. Just during the week there was a bit of sun. Went out and it's in Shandangan and it's on the Gart Road. It's only a couple of miles out. Never really knew about it or anything, but went along to take a photograph. 1912, Westrop, the Granite Grey writes of an otherworldly badger on Shandangan Lake. Lake there's alleged to be two funnel holes, eight to ten feet wide at the bottom of the lake. So they're not only in the bottom of the lakes, they're in kind of, you know, uh, hollows in the bottom of the lake, down that other world. And Francis might know this man here, Ned Queen of Cood, born, died in 1904. He saw a brown hairy monster there with another man and he said he had eyes as large as turnips. And this is, you know, uh, this is very recently the Quinn family. And Westrop, interesting, it was a great documenter of folklore, interesting for an archaeologist. He said it was probably a tussock of peat fallen off the crumbling shore. No tradition of the pest being confined by the local saint and lady here. So he's a bit, a little bit dismissive, like, you know. And who's the local saint and lady? It's Nave in, Saint Inin Bui. And of course, if there is such a monstrous 
kind of uh, fairy around the place in a locale. It's, 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 it's in a way representative of paganism and there's contestation with the local saint and the local saint usually wins out and he says because there's no tale of contestation between Brook, this one and uh, Inian Bui, he kind of undermines the testimony of, of the locals. But remarkable again, uh, Ned only died in 1904. This was his belief that he saw the, uh, the Shandangan Lake monster uh, around then. Second last thing of the evening, and one cannot talk about folklore in Nor Clare without talking about the titled lady, Maura Rua, Lady of Lemonade, one of the most notorious characters in folklore in Clare. Um, she's the Lady Macbeth of the county. Lady Macbeth, I think, was regicide, kill kings, like, you know, so the dreaded Lady of Lemonade. A titled lady and also very cruel. And this is school's collection now. This is young fellows from their elders, only in the 1930s. And she had a kind of a, a, a colourful life in terms of husbands. And of course, not trying to challenge her own. They died. It wasn't, it wasn't her that was going around the place or anything to the, to the country. She was a 25-year-old widow. She had three children. And her second manager was Conor O'Brien. And it's Conor O'Brien and Maru who built Lemonade Castle. And they had many happy years there, although this is not documented in the folklore. He, Connor, was killed by the Cromwellians uh, in 1651. And <coughs> according to the folklore, she went into Ireton, uh, the general of sorry, the Cromwellians in Limerick, and she said, line up a few Cromwellians for, uh, uh, military there, and I'll pick out the fellow with the broadest back. And she picked out, uh, what's his name, Cooper, was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she picked out Cooper, and he was her third husband. That's according to the folklore. And because there was a lot of secrecy surrounding this marriage and a lot of folklore and legend, Michael McMahon, Michael McMahon again, the great local historian, perhaps this is part of the reason why there's so much folklore about her and so much of it is very negative, perhaps in part because of this. And some say Lemonade Castle is haunted. I haven't found any evidence of it. I'm not running it out. But again, I've read from the school's collection that the avenue from Rahan Hill, which is just the hill where you rise up here, and that would have been from the gates, where the, the state gates were, that the avenue from there into the castle is haunted by the ghost of Red Mary Mora Rua. Next one, please. This is the Castle Lemonade, which she and Conor Brown built. Uh, leave out this part because this is obviously a tower house that predated it. It's one of only four of a type in Ireland. It is magnificent, it's rare, uh, and it's a essentially a kind of a, a gentleman's mansion there, 600 radical of its time in Ireland. Um, and here we go now through, if you don't mind, some of the folk belief from the school's collection pertaining to Mora Rua. Uh, old people, this is a lad picking up from Miller, they say that a castle is made of blood and mortar, and the blood is of passers-by that Mora Rua ordered her soldiers to kill. She had seven husbands, six of which she killed. A tyrant, she tortured and killed both men and women. And she hung disobedient maid servants by the hair from the corbels of the castle. In the 1950s, 200 years after she died, 1930, 200 years after she died, the school's collection proves that she was still a very much a live presence in legends in this area. And contrast her with a woman who I think may have been around a century earlier, but it's still the Middle Ages, and it's still Ireland, it's very near, it's two counties north of County Mayo, the pirate queen, Grace O'Malley. And how is she's regarded in Mayo, in folklore, a pirate queen, a warrior princess, a clan chieftain and matriarch. And the contrast then gets very, very interesting. That's that. So, the last thing of the evening, a giant at our shoulders. And this woman is called Maura. McNeil. She was born in 1904, so she's a child of a revolution. And the revolution is 1916. She's a child, you know, witnessing it all around her on the streets of Dublin. Her father, Owen McNeil, is the leader of the Irish Volunteers, who famously or notoriously, depending on your point of view, called off the revolution. That is her father. Uh, she, in 1935, at 21 years of age, joined the Irish Folklore Collection as a secretary organising just things around. And she's proceeded to become an astonishing archivist within the, the building. She collected, and recorded in her lifetime, an enormous wealth of folklore. 
She left in 1945, she left the Irish Folklore Commission, she married John Sweeney, a noted United States poet. And, you know, it, it, that was in Boston where he lived, and she started to work in Celtic studies in Harvard, which continues her, her remarkable output of Irish folklore. In 1962, she came out up with a, an encyclopedia, it's encyclopedia in the scope of the Lunasa, the great pre-Christian festival in Ireland of celebration of the harvest a major work in the field of Irish folklore. Before we came out tonight, I had a look for it online, and it's selling for about 260 euros. And I think it's a travesty that this book is not available. It's out of print, it shouldn't be. It should be published, it should be at affordable prices. It's, it's really uh, indispensable culturally, in my opinion. In 1967, she moved to Clifton Hill, as I say, two townlands, I think it's about two townlands uh, kind of east of here. And she had many happy years there, the happiest years of her life, those last 20 years of life in Clifton Hill, where she and her husband, John Sweeney, were devoted companions. They shared so much, every love in their life, art, literature, folklore, and the same ironic sense of humour. She published, uh, she wrote Wayside Dead Cairns in Ireland, Maura Ruda, Lady of Lemonade, and um, her bequest to the state was and I must get my notes about this. Where would I have left my Oh, thanks a lot, yeah. Uh, and her bequest to the state was some of their artworks, which considered, con, con, consist of a Matisse, a Picasso, and a Modigliani. And tw in, 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 she died on 15th of May 1987. She was blind. Her husband had predeceased her by one year. They're buried in Rouen, uh, the next parish over, together in the grave there. Um, what we propose in the Expo is the following, that on the 15th of May 2023 this year, on the 26th anniversary of her passing, which is also the anniversary of Owen MacDeal's death, curiously enough, that we're going to have a little evening here in the Expo to make more of Mora. It's time for us locally to make more of Mora. And next page, please. So, to tie it all together, the two Maura's, Maura McNeil and Maura um, Rua. And McNeil had done Lunasa. She thought it was a fascinating project, and it was. But she said Maura Rua, Lady of Lemonade, which came after, was probably arguably my most enthralling project. And of course, you can see her affinity with Maura Rua. Both of them are very strong women and in troubled times. It's, that's an extraordinary period of war in Ireland when Maura is, is there in the early 16, or the, the middle of the 1600s. And of course, uh, Maura um, McNeil is around when there's, there's 16 Rising, War of Independence, Civil War. Uh, she's around those times. So it's quite interesting that affinity between her, each other. She had a great sympathy for Maura. And you know, some of the, I said, the greatest happiness, greatest periods of her life were the 20 years down in Clifton Hill. And the most happy years of Maura Rua's life were a few years herself and Conor O'Brien lived together in Lemonade Castle. So you can see her, her esteem for this woman and her, her feeling for her empty for her. And you know, she liked the fact as well, and she explained what she said, this idea of her being kind of almost polygamous, people giving her that impression. She was doing what any woman would have done at the time, who had the assertion, the, the, the gumption to do it, like in a difficult age to be kind of a sort of woman. She was protecting her children's interest in inherited, in inherited lands they have by, by, by marrying uh, uh, as she did. And she said her legacy should be read in <coughs> Lemonade Castle, not in legend, you know. Uh, so it's fabulous. She said Lemony was a beacon of hope in 17th century Clare for a little time before time started to get dark in Ellen Ireland and she's considered Maura Rua to be no less than a star. Um, there's one last slide, I think, yeah. So it's also, Maura Rua did not just, or Maura McNeil did not just straighten the record about Maura Rua, she straightened the record about fairies because this is what she said. Uh, there were st fairies, belief in fairies was there as strategies by people to deal with anxiety about sudden death and accident and loss. In other words, grappling with the twin mysteries of life and death. That's what they were doing, what we're all still doing today, you know. They reflected community values, this belief in fairies, and they were like education, real kind of education, informal education, and a socialising device between people, to like sharing your stories with fairies as they did. And they're a mode of wish fulfilment or an outlet for fantasy, which we all desire and innate desire today as well. And they were a part of the fabric of everyday life.
they're more of McNeil's words, you know. There's a beautiful photograph of her in the Irish Folklore Commission um, at her desk and not a laptop in sight, you know. Uh, slow scholarship of the most amazing kind. Um, Maureen Murphy has written a great essay, a great folklore in her own right, on Maura Rua or Maura McNeil. And she said uh, she was an elegant, gentle woman. She was good. She was a shy woman. She was courteous and generous. And she says in the last line of her beautiful tribute to her essay, she says, For her family and friends, Basara in son foot, it her nullig is kosh. There is summer in the cold between Christmas and Easter. Thanks a lot. Okay.